In this final part of this lecture, we will go even a little bit further into the details of the atomic nucleus, namely its constituents, protons and neutrons. We have found now that protons and neutrons make up the nucleus. However, we can look even closer and find that protons and neutrons are extended objects in contrast, for instance, to electrons, to our knowledge today, at least. So we know from our present knowledge, nucleons as nuclear constituents that are subject to the strong force, the electromagnetic force, and the weak force. So they undergo beta decay, alpha decay, and gamma decay. We also know electrons as part of the atomic shells. And we also know that electrons can be released from the nucleus in a beta decay process. So electrons are subject to the weak force, beta decay, and to electromagnetic interaction with all the atomic structure, for instance. From the beta decay, we also know that there must be neutrinos. They occur in the beta decay and had to be introduced because we have specific energies for the initial state in the mother nucleus and specific energy for the daughter nucleus with its final state in the beta decay. However, electrons have a very wide energy distribution. If we now carry out more nuclear reactions, we can produce various reaction products, among them a plethora, an entire zoo of new particles. Among them are particles subject to the strong interaction, and we call them hadrons. It comes from the Greek word for strong. They are so-called heavy hadrons, at least the first hadrons that were additionally discovered were quite heavy and therefore called baryons for heavy. And an example for such a, such a baryon is the nucleon itself. There are other baryons such as the delta particle or the omega particle and so on. Then there are hadrons that are a little lighter. The first hadrons in this mass regime to be discovered were in their masses between the nucleon and, say, the electron. So at that time, they were called mesons, medium mass hadrons. Nowadays, of course, we know mesons that are much heavier than the regular nucleon, but still we are using the name meson. And an example of that is the pion, particular particle. In addition, we also find weakly interacting particles. First, brothers and sisters of charged leptons, brothers and sisters of the electron, namely the mu particle and the tau particle. And then there are neutral leptons in addition to the electron neutrino. We also find mu neutrinos and tau neutrinos. To all these particles, we have antiparticles. So we have quite a large number of particles. And in addition to these reactions, we may study which particles may be produced in what kind of reaction. So there is a number of conservation laws that need to be obeyed. First, charge needs to be conserved. The energy must be conserved. And we find, for instance, that in a nuclear reaction, usually the baryon number is conserved not usually, but all the time. Which means if we collide two protons in order to produce an antiproton, we must in addition produce another proton or neutron because the total number of baryons that was two before the collision needs to be two after the collision and the antiproton calls as an antibaryon so is counted by minus one. We can also find that the lepton number must be conserved. And not only in total, but also for each so-called flavor or family or generation. 
So this means if we have a radioactive beta decay, and in the beta decay we produce one electron, so we generate a lepton, we need an antilepton to be produced at the same time, in this case an antineutrino, an electron antineutrino. If a muon decays to an electron, then we need to release, in addition, muon and electron neutrinos. The example for the beta decay can be seen on the transparency. We find additional conservation laws with new particles, and there have been several names for that, strangeness conservation, charm conservation, hypercharge conservation. We find new symmetry properties, namely that the laws of physics need to be invariant if we simultaneously change parity, return the time arrow, and change all the particles into their antiparticles. That's the CPT invariance. So normally we have discussed parity in our lecture as changing just all spatial coordinates into their negative values. And normally all the laws of physics are exactly the same, no matter if you are calculating it with plus r or minus r. So making a point symmetry. However, weak interaction and beta decay do not obey this law. They are breaking parity symmetry. However, the combined application of changing the parity, point symmetry, and changing particles into antiparticles, which means instead of a beta plus decay, uh, beta minus decay, we are looking at a beta plus decay, will lead us to exactly the same situation, and the symmetries of physics are preserved. However, there are other reactions that even violate that, and for that, in total, we need to set up an invariance with respect to charge symmetry, parity, and time reversal. But that's just uh, a little side remark. When we look at leptons, at electrons and at neutrinos, we do not detect any structure. They are tiny. To our knowledge, they have no size at all, and at least they are, their size is of the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters. Hadrons, however, have a non-zero size, giving rise to the um, surmise that these objects consist of even smaller particles. This is corroborated by the fact that we even observe excited states for hadrons. So we can define excited states of the nucleon, and we can interpret this by the substructure of protons and neutrons. The usual explanation, and as a reasonable first step, is that hadrons are a composite object with the constituents being the so-called quarks. They are, again, different quark flavors grouped into different quark families or generations. And we can distinguish between baryons being a three-quark state, so an object made up of three quarks, and mesons being quark-antiquark -quark states. A proton in this picture is being made up of three quarks, two with the flavor up and one with the flavor down. A neutron is then one up quark and two down quarks. An example for a meson is given by a system consisting of a charm quark and an anti-charm quark that in some configurations are, is called J-Psi. Also discussed, for instance, the hydrogen atom, which is very similar to a system like that. So again, we have two charged particles with different charges in close interaction.
The diagram that I had just shown to introduce the quark model shows different colors for the different quarks. Looking at the various particles created, we need to introduce a new quantum number, which is basically the charge for the strong interaction, for the strong nuclear force. This charge is called color in analogy with visible light. Because it is very straightforward to introduce these quarks, however, we have no, not ever seen a quark isolated outside a nucleus or outside a baryon or meson. We've always seen mesons and baryons, but we've never been able to prepare out a single quark. The reason for that lies in the, in the interaction between the quarks. They have a very strong interaction, and the problem is that when you try to pull apart two quarks inside a meson or three quarks in, in a baryon, if you try to pull them apart, then the force gets stronger and stronger. And you have to pump so much energy into the system that it's energy, energetically favored to produce new particles, and you don't get the quarks apart. Therefore, this so-called confinement requirement, the quarks have to be confined in hadrons, We introduced a requirement which tells us that this color degree of freedom, so the internal charge of the quarks with respect to the strong interaction, may not be visible outside. They, may, they must be color neutral. And as you can mix the colors red, green, and blue to white, it was proposed to use three so-called, or basically charged states of the quarks, called red, green, and blue, to form a color-neutral object, a baryon. So red, green, and blue in a three-quark state make a white object, the baryon. Looking for mesons, we have always a quark and an antiquark which means we have, for instance, a red quark and an anti-red quark. They, again, are color neutral in their sum. In that way, we can explain why there are only baryons with three colors and mesons with a color and an anti-color. The strong force, as I said, gets even stronger the farther I pull the quarks apart. Part of the reason for that is the fact that gluons, as the exchange particles, the force carriers between the quarks, are charged themselves. So they have color. And therefore, they may interact with each other. One can even think of states consisting of gluons only, although such a thing has never been observed so far. The theoretical framework to describe the strong force in this color concept is called quantum chromodynamics, from chromos, the Greek word for color. And if we plot the potential, the energy, between two quarks that we pull apart, we find that the interior part looks a little bit like the Coulomb potential. So we have a 1 over R scaling, however, with a different coupling constant, of course, and towards large values of the distance R, we have a linear scaling behavior. So putting in more energy by trying to pull apart the quarks produces new particles due to the confinement. In the end, we are arriving at a scheme which is explained within the so-called standard model of particle physics. It tells us the elementary particles 
that are existent in our world. You see it on the transparency. On one side, there are the leptons. They are elementary particles, and there are two different types of electrons, neutral ones, electron, muon, and tau neutrino, with charge zero, and charge minus one, we have charged leptons, electron, muon, and tau. We have the weak interaction acting on all these particles, while on the electromagnetic interaction is acting on the charged leptons only. In principle, they may also act on the neutrinos, but their interaction is really extremely small. We neglect gravity because this cannot be implemented in the standard model at the present time. The strong interaction is important for quarks that form hadrons in the form of baryons as a three-quark state or mesons at a two-quark state. We may distinguish between quarks having a charge of minus one-third of an elementary charge. These are the down quark, the strange quark, and the bottom quark. Again, we have grouping into three families or three generations. While we have other quarks with charges of plus two-thirds in units of elementary charge, and these are the up quark, the charm quark, and the tau quark. Quarks are subject to strong interaction, electromagnetic interaction, and weak interaction. And finally, the last column shows the exchange particles, the force carriers. While we do not know the graviton, the exchange particle of, the, of gravity, which is not included in the standard model, we know that weak interaction is mediated by W and Z bosons. The photon mediates electromagnetic interaction, and the strong interaction couples to the quarks via gluons. So, do we know everything now? There are still a lot of open questions, and some of them can be seen and can be addressed in an interview that uh, I led with Christian Fischer, and that is an additional extra to this lecture. But we live in very exciting times. There are many new facilities coming up, and experimental techniques have increased quite a bit enhancing our knowledge in atomic physics, in molecular physics, solid state physics, nuclear physics, and now also particle physics. So while around 1900, the experimental methods were able to resolve scales of the order of angstroms with energy scales around the electron volt, one had to introduce the concept of quanta, of atoms and had to build up quantum mechanics. Around 1930, we were looking at the atomic nucleus more closely. Yukawa came up with the first ideas for a strong force for understanding how the nucleus holds together at a level of 10 femtometers diameter and energy scales of the order of mega electron volts. Around 1960s or 1970s, we were looking so far into the proton, inside the proton, that we can, could start describing the internal structure of the nucleons as constituents of the nuclei. So we arrived at quantum chromodynamics for describing the nucleon at scales below one femtometer and energy scales around one GeV and above. And finally, Nowadays, we are starting our projects like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, where we have energies available of the order of 10 tera electron volts and thereby attack scales of the order of about one atometer. This might give us access to the so-called weak scale and help us address a number of still open questions beyond the standard model, such as why do we actually have three families or generations? 
Why are the forces that we observe, strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force, why are they so different? Is there a unified theory for everything? And what does our universe actually consist of? We know nowadays from various experiments in astronomy, astroparticle physics, particle physics, and nuclear physics that our universe consists of 95% of unknown stuff, dark matter and dark energy, and only 5% is what we actually understand and describe with our currently available models. Where do these dark energy and dark matter concepts come from? And why is there a mass for particles? These issues and more are being addressed at the Large Hadron Collider and at various experiments worldwide in new facilities.